Good morning, everybody. I think everybody can hear me. It's a little hard to know. Um, this is Jim Christensen. You can't see me, um, but then this is the first uh, Provincial Department of Emergency Medicine Grand Rounds that we've had on a Zoom platform. And um, I'm very pleased today to welcome and, and thank uh, Dave Sweet and Adam Thomas for giving us this, uh, this session today. They are um, very heavily into the management, the ICU management of COVID-19 patients. Both are emergency trained. And, um, and focusing on COVID-19, Dave is uh, internationally renowned as an expert in sepsis overall. And Adam has spent an amazing amount of time and like around the world is actually becoming an international expert as well in COVID-19 management. So I'm gonna turn it over to them. We have about, how many do we have now? On the, we have 91 um, people uh, in the audience across the province. So thank you very much for joining. And um, this will be a session that will probably go for close to an hour, maybe a little bit more, and then we've got extra time today for questions because we know that there will be lots of questions. So I'll be trying to field them back to, um, to Dave and Adam. So uh, welcome, and let's get on with it. Thank you, guys. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jim. So we are excited to be giving our talk today on um, COVID-19. And I think it's important to know uh, that we are not experts. And in fact, I was booked to give this talk on my blood culture research. And Jim very politely a couple months ago said, the best way you could, I don't think people want to hear about your blood culture research and they need to hear about some COVID stuff. So I called the person that I think is it, uh, just an um, incredible resource for all of us provincially uh, around COVID-19 and through knowledge translation to the ICU networks. Um, as well as uh, through uh, the emergency community. So I asked Adam to join me today to talk about um, some of these concepts um, around COVID. Now, one thing I didn't know is that when you uh, decide to do work with Adam, um, you do it through Zoom and you get a lot of pictures that look just like this um, with his son Gabe uh, participating in our discussions as much as he is. Can I just point out, Dave, can you go back to that slide though? Dave and I are of a very similar generation Dave still hasn't figured out how to take a screenshot. <laughs> that is a photo of a screen. Whatever, Adam, whatever. Yeah. I have no disclosures. Uh, I, as well, uh, don't take any money from any companies, but what I would like to thank is two people. One, Dr. Gary Misselbrook. So he's one of our uh, international fellows, and we took a couple slides from him. And a lot of our information comes from the source journals, peer-reviewed literature, but a lot also comes from the free open access medical education, for which maybe I am a little biased because I really support that community. I am not worthy to share this stage with Dave Sweet. Um, many of you have seen this in the provincial group from days, uh, merge days when he used to be a uh, uh, I can't model. escape those, uh, those modeling can't days. Get rid of those. Dave is per base of everywhere. This is Eric Wu wearing Dave Sweet socks. So um, <laughs> Dave is very popular on the unit and he's there everywhere, whether in right. person or in spirit. On a serious note, um, just because COVID got crazy, personally, I wasn't able to uh, say bye to Dennis, for which I'll always feel bad about, but I think everybody in the province really knew this man, 46 year emerge career. Uh, and we recently just lost, lost him and that, that's a pretty heavy loss. So I'm hoping at the end of this talk, I'd get a little nod from Dennis and his classic good show. Today, what are we gonna talk about? Dave gave me three objectives and 40 slides to do it in, and he gets one objective, but his is the core. So <laughs> today we're gonna to talk about reminding ourselves what an ARDS definition is, and does this COVID pneumonitis actually apply to that? We'll talk about phenotypes and how that changes clinical management. And then we'll talk about organ-specific dysfunction. Now, jo or, sorry, uh, Dave. Uh, Dave, there you go. <laughs> Dave is taking the core where a lot of people are focused on coagulopathy and then treatments out there. And today what we're gonna do is we have obviously our slide deck we're gonna go through, uh, but we're gonna have some uh, points where we stop and just have a discussion and this is live. We don't know what we're necessarily gonna talk about, uh, where we're gonna talk about it. So um, we may have to jump over based on time and how much time we spend, but it's an experiment. And classic Zoom meeting too, so Jim is going to field questions. So if you guys have burning questions, put on a lot of exclamation marks, I guess. But other than that, we'll try to field them at the end. So what are we talking about? This tricky little RNA virus 
you guys can see it's quite a small virus, but there's three main areas I want you to focus on, the E, M, and S protein. And the spike protein is where all the money is. And that is A, where the virus gets into the ACE2 receptor, but B, where a lot of targets are for both therapeutics and vaccines. Have we seen this before? Yes. So the big other beta coronaviruses are SARS and MERS. Uh, but there's a lot of coronaviruses that we see in the eMERGE ambulatory shifts or pediatrics all the time, those common colds. Where we're at worldwide, though, is more than 4.2 million cases that we know about and over 287 deaths. This is last night. I'm sure if you looked at this dashboard this morning, the numbers are even higher. In Canada, 71,000 cases, uh, and we're, we know that the East Coast is being hit hardest and we have over 5,000 deaths reported. BC is doing well though, compared to the rest of Canada, we have flattened our curve for a variety of factors that are outside this talk. Our dashboard as of last night, uh, we currently only have 18 admitted ICU patients across the province uh, and we have 66 in hospital. So we're definitely on the downslope heading to the next phase. How are people doing? So. I don't know if you guys saw this BC CDC report uh, from Dr. Henry and her group, but we're doing really well. When we have capacity and time to have healthcare interventions and population-based interventions, our mortality of hospitalized patients is more than half the reported mortality of, of the best centers out there um, and even better than most. So most mortality out there ranges is from 25 to 50% of hospitalized patients. Here we're seeing 14.1% and that's across the province. We're doing well. VCH in particular, so the only numbers to stay focused on are the cumulative total hospitalized so far are 154, for which 41 have been ventilated. That picture is a, a just a little teaser of what our COVID unit looks like at VGH in particular. Um, so we have a multidisciplinary team in our PPE there um, and doing well. For the eMERGE group, I really wanted to highlight Hussein Kanji's provincial work, working with all the critical care leads. Uh, this is the current dashboard of ventilator capable beds in the province. And we have 697 vent capable beds. Uh, and this is a hodgepodge of current ICU HAU beds, um, some PACU beds, et cetera, et cetera. And what you can see is as of last week, we were only at 17% of our total capacity and that's both COVID and non-COVID patients. So we're doing well. Um, that's the current uh, buffer zone we have if numbers pick up. How those numbers pick up will be very different. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. Dave and I have talked a lot about where this could go. This is BC CDC modeling. And basically what you see is that steep takeoff happens at 80% of increase of our current physical distancing. Meaning if we take our current physical distancing practices and we release them up into 80%, uh, then we'll see a secondary wave coming late summer, early spring. This is the basis of the stage response that Dr. Henry and her team has out there. Why is this important? Modeling can change and the States is the best example of that. On the screen in the bottom, what you see is the red line is the model deaths in the States. The blue line is the actual reported deaths. So models can be wrong and population interventions, I can't say enough, are very important. Now, Dave, we're worried about this. Healthcare worker infections, we're all worried. We heard eight to 30% infected in Italy versus Wuhan, right? But I think to reassure everybody, what we're seeing now is our PPE works and when community spread is low, healthcare worker infections are low. So ever hospitalized 33 with one death. And that death, I wasn't involved in the case, but I think it's not, not a straightforward death at all. So um, that's just to reassure everyone. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on diagnosis because I think everybody's had a lot of memos and we don't wanna talk about this in general. But what I do wanna highlight is this is the IDSA guidelines. You will have the slides after guys, but one nasal pharyngeal swab is not a, enough. Uh, when your suspicion is high and your community spread is high, Dave just published a paper on this. So Dave, what did you guys find? 
Well, the, the case that we pre, uh, published was a um, case we had in the ICU with BGH where the, they swabbed four times negative in and outside of hospital and then four. after intubation with bronchoscopy tested positive. We're unaware if this was a nosocomial acquired infection or did it reactivate because they did get steroids for COP. So we're not totally sure, but definitely in the literature, we can say that one MPW is probably around the range of 60% sensitive. And again, the gold standard being CT scans. So we're not even sure if that's accurate. I've asked our microbiology people to give us an idea on how sensitive it is. And it really starts sort of looks like around 60 to 70. And then every test you do thereafter, it gets closer to 100. And around three tests, it's around 95%. I also asked the value of tracheal versus MPW. I didn't get a straightforward answer, except that tracheal are presumed to be more sensitive. And I just want to highlight what Dave said is, uh, when you say a CT scan is gold standard, you alluded to that it isn't, which I totally agree, that a lot of patients don't present with just respiratory infection. Right. So you're missing a lot there. Whether that's 20% or not, we have no real idea. Where is virus found? So this is important for eMERGE because the bodily fluids we need to be worried about, we're dealing with in the trenches all the time. So of course the upper respiratory tract, the lower respiratory tract, including the eyes, the sputum, the nasopharyngeal swabs and lower tract swabs, but also peritoneal fluid, stool, anal swabs, rectal swabs for sure. Urine, even though kidneys have in themselves viral uh, inclusion bodies on histology, there's been no reported virus and probably pH related. And then of course blood. Um, blood is positive, so you gotta be careful handling those. The ones that threw me off are per peritoneal fluid. So if you're doing paracentesis and we get a second surge, just be careful when you're doing that procedure. Obviously the surgeons as well. Pathophysiology. So let's get into the bread and butter of this talk. So COVID pneumonitis, a viral pneumonia, yes or no, Dave? Viral pneumonia? Mm -hmm. I'm going to say yes. Yeah. Yes, I'm going to say yes. Is it different than all the other viral pneumonias we're seeing? Maybe. It certainly seems to have some characteristics that are atypical um, from what we've seen in other viral pneumonias. So the big ones we see that end up in eMERGE being intubated in ICU are your classic influenzas, your H1N1, your H5, all those. Now, what is different? I'm going to get into some hypotheses in this lecture, and uh, nobody knows. If anyone tells you definitively they know about a disease that wasn't present six months ago, I think we can all be take that with a grain of salt. But what we're trying to have for a pedagogical um, paradigm is how to think about this. So early stage one, early infection, this is so-called minimal symptoms or asymptomatic period. This is really your latency period. So people are peaking with their viral levels. They have minimal symptoms, maybe URTI is a common cold, but their viral levels are high. That's stage one. Ideally, when Dave gets into it, this is probably where your antivirals are gonna work because that's when the virus is replicating and doing its damage. But the problem is, how do you target that population native? Exactly. If they're minimally symptomatic, you don't know whether you're gonna give remdesivir in the water, and we'll get into that. The other stage two is when eMERGE is probably seeing these patients. They're starting to have respiratory symptoms. They're starting to be symptomatic in which it's impacting their daily life. So this pulmonary phase uh, is when they start to get dyspneic or tachypneic and hypoxemic. Hypoxia is a definite thing we'll get into. I might say there too, what's well, something that's interesting about coronavirus, or sorry, uh, SARS-CoV-2, is that influenza and SARS-CoV-2, they seem to have the highest viral titers when they present or when they get symptoms, where MERS and previous SARS seem to get the highest viral titers later in the disease course around seven days. So that may affect how we use our antivirals. Completely. It's a huge point. Now, what is different about this disease is there seems to be a host inflammatory reaction that is more profound than what we're used to. And maybe it's because we're looking and the numbers are so high because this virus is so effective at spreading that when you infect a vast majority of the population, that small subset that we rarely see are presenting at higher numbers. It's hard to say. But this inflammatory response comes 8 to 14 to 21 days, and we've even seen it to 35 days in some of our patients in the unit. This is marked by low viral titer levels, but actually high multi-organ failure, ARDS, shock, et cetera, that we're used to seeing in the ICU. And the important question we don't know is this a 
um, a physiologic immune response to the infection, or is it a pathological immune response to the infection? And that's still debatable, this concert on cytokine storm that Adam will talk about. So comparing ARDS definitions, what we learn for our horrible exams is that Berlin definition. So we say bilateral pacifications, and it's an acute process. It's not from cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and your PF ratio is less than 300. There's no atelectasis or, or effusions that are rapidly reversible. That is a very broad definition. And the reason why it can cause troubles is two examples here. Let's say both these patients have a PF ratio of 150. They have moderate to severe ARDS. But if you look at them, they have two very different disease processes. On the left is COVID pneumonitis. On the right is Narcan-induced negative pressure pulmonary edema. They both present with hypoxemic respiratory failure. But the management from MERS to ICU of COVID-19 pneumonitis is very different than negative pressure pulmonary edema, meaning trying to sedate, intubate this pseudo-ARDS might not be the best management. Also, that might be the case for COVID-19. So what, what you'll see out uh, in the literature and more importantly in social media that is very confusing to people is whether this is real ARDS or not. And what I will tell you is it is and it isn't. And what I'm gonna say in the rest of this talk and Dave, Dave's a proponent of this is that we should be more specific with what ARDS is. And the definition we should use is what the PROCEVA trial used. PROCEVA trial was our one trial in ARDS that showed mortality benefit of proning. And what they wanted to be specifically say is, if you're ventilated and optimized on the ventilator for 24 to 48 hours, if your PF ratio is under 150 after that optimization, you still have ARDS. And the package treatment that we all talk about pertains to that. Is that fair, Dave? I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Giving some time to see if there is recruitable lung that suggests that they don't need the aggressive therapies. But as you're going to talk about, there may be a different subset that remain profoundly hypoxic, hypoxemic, uh, despite um, x-ray improvement. Now, why is COVID more troubling than our classic bronchopneumonias or the other hypoxemic respiratory failures? It comes down to surface area and real estate. So when COVID affects the lower respiratory tract infection, it seems to develop and, and use the distal airways and alveoli. Just like we see in RSV in babies, it's a distal airway disease. And when you hit distal airways, you get a lot of parenchyma involved. Contrast that with a bronchial pneumonia where you just get this low bar consolidation. Both can, it can cause profound hypoxemia. On the bottom right, you see a complete collapse of the left lower lobe and you have torrential lung shunt. We can see someone on 100% oxygen for that. But managing them on the vent or high flow or non-invasive is very different than someone on the top left with COVID pneumonitis whose physiology can be dramatically different because they have a lot of real estate involved. Yeah. Now, ARDS, this phenotypes, we're gonna get into it, but what I wanna remind everyone where we came from, in 2016, the Lung Safe study was an epidemiologic survey of all ARDS across the world. And what they showed is for given levels of PEEP, there was very variable compliances, meaning for a change in volume, or sorry, a given volume and a change in pressure, the lungs you saw in ARDS were all the way from totally normal to hyper compliant to socked in very poor compliance. We've seen this before. This is not a trend that is consistent only with COVID pneumonitis or viral pneumonitis in itself. Fair to say, Dave? Fair to say. Okay. Now, Gatnoni came out with phenotypes. We're gonna to counter to that. But what I wanna say first is that that is not necessarily the experience we're seeing with COVID either. So this is coming out of Boston and Massachusetts general. And we've seen this with our local data with MIPSACON showing us, is that for given patients, there are variable compliances. And early to late in the disease, there's a big spread. So in the bottom left, what you're seeing there is the compliance is on the left and the days and symptoms is on the x-axis. And you range from a compliance of in the 20s to all the way in the 60s. And a normal compliance, the inflection normally we would say was 40 to 60. So you're seeing people with low compliance and high compliance. I think that's very important to understand that 
Um, you're going to have to tailor your treatment to the individual in front of you. You have to try to determine the elastins and compliance of their lung, what pressures you're going to need to ventilate, and it's going to be individualized of what you see. So they may be very stiff lung, non-compliant, or compliant lung and have hypoxemia despite that. We'll get into that. And that's huge. I think you brought it up now, Dave, and for everyone listening and saying, why does this matter? It matters because if you're switching them from spontaneously breathing and unsupported to either non-invasive support or in mechanical ventilation, if you're hammering a lung that can't take that volume or that pressure, you're going to cause injury. So that's really important to know what your patient's compliance is. Also, pseudo-ARDS is wearing its uh, naked, no, wearing its ugly face, shall we say. So same cohort of patients. You can see by day two, their PF ratio is raised, and it's raised above the level of your standard Berlin definition for ARDS. Now, there's caveats here. When you intubate someone at six liters nasal prongs, by day two, their PF ratio is great, and you can extubate them, probably because they didn't need intubation in the first place. However, other caveats saying, maybe you optimized them, you chilled them out, their lungs got better even within 48 hours. We don't know, it's still early days, but what we're seeing is the classic ARDS trends that we're talking about, just like before COVID, are still present in COVID. Great. So enter the happy hypoxemic patient. You guys have seen this on Twitter, so this photo is coming out of New York, and you see someone prone, awake, on a high-flow nasal cannula. There's the positive texting sign. She's on her phone. But if you really look into the vitals, that is a good plan. Her pulse ox is 54%. She's tachycardic at 137, and her rest rate is 23, so she's mildly to Kipnik. And we're going to get into this physiology, but remember... This patient is doing really well with her delivery of oxygen matching her required oxygen, DO2 and VO2. She's got no end organ dysfunction that we know about, and even with a low arterial, arterial set, she was doing okay. Yeah, and this makes me nervous, and this is where yes. we have to be careful because obviously an oxygen set of what, 54%, and we're saying that she's hypoxemic but not hypoxic. In fact, we don't know that. You need to be able to do a better clinical exam, what's your urine output, what's her lactate, in fact, she could be hypoxic and we don't know. And maybe this is some of the reasons that we see all these sudden cardiac arrests because strained systems are doing this to people. And then they have a sudden cardiac arrest because they've been sitting with a SAT of 54 and have zero reserve and quickly tip over to where they're decompensated. Huge point. And we're going to get into this to management, but very important to individualize your care and not have these big cookie cutter approaches to patient's management with hypoxemic and ventilatory failure. Why does this happen though? How can you get someone who looks okay and has profound hypoxemia? What it looks like is not just a pneumonitis, but an endotheliolitis or endothelial dysfunction. And what I mean about that is this is a dual energy CT. And what it is matching is ventilation, so the green panels, and perfusion. So we're looking directly at VQ matching. If you look at the axial cuts of the CT, there's not a lot of ground glass. Remember, these are just cuts, one image of a whole stack, and there is disease. There's ground glass opacifications from COVID. But what I want everyone to pay attention to here is those areas that are most affected, you can see that they're being perfused. Normally what should happen is if our alveoli are not seeing air, they should clamp down on their pre-alveoli uh, arterial, and that would be effective hypoxemic pulmonary vasoconstriction. But what you're seeing here is it's not happening. And why is that, Dave? It's a really good question. It certainly seems like there's the theories out there, there's one of two processes, either inappropriate vasodilation, so lack of hypoxic vasoconstriction, and therefore BQ mismatching, or the concept of microthrombi within the lung, there through passive pressure, blood going to areas that it shouldn't be going to, or passive pressure dilation. And this is where we can talk maybe a bit about the proning. Like, the only things that make sense to me is if it's true that you're proning these people, for example, awake, and your oxygenation goes up, which we've had cases that we've done that in transport even to prone people for transport. And when we saw that, their oxygenation immediately improved. So that means that however, whatever's going on, you have to be, you have a better VQ match in doing that. 
The theory is you need to lie posterior or supine, that your heart's sitting on the base of your lungs, your abdomen's pushing up, so you get atelectasis when you're usually supine in the posterior dorsal aspect of your lung. Now, blood usually doesn't go there because you have hypoxic vasoconstriction, et cetera. So if for whatever reason, during this disease, you have inappropriate vasodilation there, you effectively have a shunt. Now, you prone somebody, you reduce those effects and actually have more homogeneous lung prone than you do when you're supine. So that must improve your BQ matching. So it needs to be a process that's affecting that. Thoughts? It makes total sense to me. Um, knowing that we just talked about there is variable uh, lung compliance and aeration, and we're going to get into that in a sec. Other contributors to the both BQ mismatch and dead space problems are A, so just the lung shunt from itself with this ground glass that continues to consolidate the processes, B, macroscopic emboli. So remember, a classic PE that is not causing any hemodynamic effects is not a, a VQ mismatch. It shouldn't cause hypoxemia in itself. It's more a dead space issue. However, when you start to get VQ mis or sorry, uh, RV dysfunction, then you get hypoxemia. And often, often, if you have that microvascular thrombosis throughout the lung or even a PE, Again, you've maybe taken a chunk of your lung out that usually you'll be getting blood. That blood's got to go somewhere. It's going to go elsewhere throughout the lung that maybe there was usually some hypoxic vasoconstriction where blood wouldn't be going there from poor ventilation. Now it's forced, and that gives you the VQ mismatch or shunt. And what Dave just brought up, too, is the microthrombi that we're really going to pay attention to. And it's, for some reason in COVID, they have a pulmonary uh, microvascular disease uh, that Dave's going to allude to a bit later. Now, what you see is words are important, and a lot of people listening trained me, Dave trained me, and I'm bad with my words. But this is one example when we have to be very particular. Hypoxemia is not hypoxia. Permissive hypoxia means you're a bad doctor. You're allowing end organ dysfunction by definition, whereas hypoxemia, low arterial uh, oxyhemoglobin saturation, may not be a problem. Now, just to review, remember hypoxemia caused by hypoventilation, low inspired oxygen, VQ mismatch, right to left shunt, and very rarely diffusion limitation. And the reason I bring that up is you'll see some crazy things online about this being high altitude pulmonary edema. It is not. Uh, even the world experts, you can get someone on Everest on a bike and they still don't have diffusion limitation. So just get rid of that. Don't give your patients box. It's crazy versus hypoxia. Fair, yeah, fair enough. Now, I think this might be coming, uh, we can talk about this near the end, about the idea about when do you intubate somebody, for example, and do you watch these people? Like, for the record, a SATA 45 makes me extremely nervous, no matter what they look like. But maybe we should be watching for things like dyspnea and distress more than an absolute number, because we hear out of New York, these people with a SATA 75 for days and just being watched. Is this actually a unique disease, or is this they're being forced to do this from resource limitation, and maybe other diseases would look like this too? To be honest, we just don't know. Dave, you just brought up the balancing act, which I think in emerging critical care we're trying to do all the time in respiratory failure, and it comes down when I can't oxygenate, how do I balance delivery of oxygen to the required metabolic demands, matching DO2 and VO2? And I'm probably not one of your smartest critical care trainees, but what I will say is I think most of ICU care is matching DO2 and VO2. Yeah. When we support patients who are critically unwell and emerge in ICU, this is what we're trying to do. Remember, delivery of oxygen, it's a simple thing. You need to get oxygen into the body. You need to carry it, uh, whether it's bound to hemoglobin or dissolved in your blood, and you need to pump a heart that delivers it everywhere. And how we deliver oxygen is not always reaching for the endotracheal tube. Because remember, most of the time when we intubate someone for respiratory failure, failure to oxygenate or ventilate, it's a trade-off between taking them from a physiologic ventilation strategy to a pathologic positive pressure strategy. And most of the time when we do that, it's because I want to sedate them, paralyze them, and get rid of VO2. And I want to maximize DO2, meaning when I put in the endotracheal tube, I can take them to 100% of an inspired FiO2 and make sure that they're not in training room air. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest thing what Dave just brought up with watching patients with low arterial uh, oxygen sat, as in an SpO2 that maybe is low. 
I think what's happening there is these patients are profoundly tachypneic, not necessarily dyspneic, not working all the time, but when you're breathing at 35 and your flow rates are like 100, 150, maybe 200 mils a minute, and you're just on some nasal prongs, you are in training room air. So you're probably not getting as much oxygen as we think. Great. So just remember that the endotracheal tube in itself is not necessarily the thing that will maximize DO2. Now phenotypes, 30 minutes into this talk, we've seen this. So the Italians are opposite of us. They think in elastance, and elastance and compliance are inversely related, meaning if type L, low elastance, means they have high compliance. And what that is just saying is these lungs are full of air. And what they have problems is not filling with air, they have problems getting rid of their air. Type H is high elastance and low compliance, completely opposite, and that's traditional phenotype that we talk about in ARDS. If you look at these CTs, and just with proning alone, like they've talked about, type H looks like it would definitely respond to proning because you've got all the blood going posterior following gravity, and those lungs are soft in, consolidated with air bronchograms, and they're not getting aerated. Flipping them over just matches gravity to where the air is going. Is this a thing, though? And there's a lot of caveats here. So Gatnoni, a legend in the ARDS, he and his work is where we get the baby lung concept from, he published a case series of 16 patients. And what he said is the PF ratios with the type L were relatively higher than the PF ratios with the type H. But clinically, a PF ratio of 95 versus 84 in the unit, is that really different? Not necessarily. No. But why this is important is people have used this maybe inappropriately to say that type L's, your vent management is different than your type H's and get rid of all our ARDS lung protective ventilation strategies. And to me, this is a bit confusing, Dave, because like before COVID came around, we were worried about oxygen toxicity, ventilator-induced lung injury, volume, barrel. And you hope people came that oxygen toxicity is not a real thing. It's, yeah, it's only even one hundred percent for a week, right? Yeah. Not necessarily true. So we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, as Chris Nixon says. Uh, so we just have to be careful. So these phenotypes may not, it just might be a spectrum of disease like we keep talking about that we've seen before. And it's not particular just to COVID. COVID's other things with the endothelial dysfunction and the coagulopathy that Dave's going to get into is, is real. But when it comes to the lung mechanics, might not just be particular to COVID. Proning works though. We are going to reassess this, or sorry, we're going to reaffirm this now for the third time, like Dave and I have said, is that early proning, they don't have to be ventilated, it will increase their oxygenation. And this is out of Ontario, out of Western University, out of New York, and out of Italy. We do know with these cohorts, flip them over and do it in eMERGE. Just ask them. Uh, Alan Lai, one of the eMERGE nurses at VGH, he's really into this because it's pretty simple to have someone who's texting on the phone just say, hey, can you roll over every 15 minutes? And they're fine to it. And the real question, again, even when it comes with the use of CPAP, is that are we improving oxygenation or are we preventing lung injury? Another thing we didn't say that when you prone someone, you make your pleural space pressure, your pleural pressures and transpulmonary pressures more homogeneous. So in a sense, it can be protective against your own high negative pressure inspiration or when we're ventilating someone with positive pressure. Same thing with the CPAP. If your oxygenation goes up with pressure, you're recruiting lung, period. It has to be. But the reason that he's put on PPAP, CPAP again, partially resource limitation, but putting someone on CPAP might actually reduce their own lung injury as well. It may recruit lungs, prevent atelectasis with each breath or atelectrauma, and therefore reduce lung injury that progress on to an H type. So that's one of the concepts that this early proning, early CPAP may be beneficial. What Dave is um, getting to, I uh, didn't say it particularly, is the self-induced lung injury. Uh, and and we're, we're all into that. So why is this important? Um, remember, hammering aerated lungs versus non-aerated lungs with a lot of PEEP and a lot of volume can cause damage. And what that damage is, is on the left, you see barotrauma. So you see pneumomediastinum, bilateral pneumothoraces, and a lot of sub-Q air. And this is someone who was ventilated on minimal PEEP, a PEEP of eight, and their plats were still in the 60s. So you have to be very careful about what's going on in your patient's physiology. And more importantly, what you're seeing is classic prolonged vent-induced vent lung injury in this patient on the right, where in the dorsal-dependent lung, 
um, on the bottom green arrow, that's this all white fibrotic looking lung, that's not normal. And then the baby lung, the anteroventral lung, is all hemorrhaged and nasty. And the bigger picture is if you look at the thorax for all you crazy eMERGE docs that have done thoracotomies, you shouldn't see the heart like that easy. Uh, and this is someone who's endotracheal intubated and clamped endotracheal tube w w with inflated lungs. Those lungs are gone. This is someone with advanced disease that is not having a lung that can be inflated anymore. So DO2, VO2. I just want to keep re-emphasizing that you don't have to reach just for your endotracheal tube. You guys have been treating hypoxemic respiratory failure for decades before COVID came around. So use your normal armamentarium. What that means is nasal prongs, non-rebreathers, high flow, CPAP, BiPAP in the right patient populations. Intubate early for your classic intubation, airway, expected course, et cetera, et cetera, but always match your DO2 and your VO2. Before I hand over to Dave, I think it's really important we get into silly. So you talked about self-induced lung injury, and Dave, what you were trying to get at is this transpulmonary pressure. What is that? Well, it's the idea that when we use lung protective ventilation in someone who's ventilated, we try to watch the pressures that you're giving when you give breaths of air. Um, and we look at the amount of pressure that's created when you give a small breath of air, for example, which is the driving pressure. So the concept is, is that there are certain pressures that when given to the alveoli cause damage. There are concepts that actually people spontaneously breathing big negative intrathoracic pressures with or without some form of positive pressure will therefore increase that transpulmonary pressure and cause injury. So the idea is if you breathe hard enough, long enough, you're going to injure your, in, you're going to injure your lungs and they end up more like that H type that we talked about, which is diffuse, stiff lung injury. Now in Emerge, we can't drop esophageal balloons in all our spontaneously breathing patients. That's not practical. Um, so having those numbers with your transpulmonary pressure is not going to be able to measure for all our patients. But what equates to a high transpulmonary pressure is someone we know we've seen at the bedside all the time, someone who's working hard. If they've got their accessory muscles going, their belly breathing, that is someone that's generating big swings in your transpulmonary, your transpleural pressures. So do you think we should be intubating those people that are working hard to protect them? So I think that's the patient we used to intubate before. No matter what the number was, if they looked like shit, to be mm -hmm. honest, we intubated them, mm -hmm. right? I think that's the right patient, is look at how your patient looks in front of you. Just to push you a bit, what about taking those people, putting them on a Presidex infusion, maybe a low-dose ketamine infusion, keeping them not intubated, and see if you can just reduce their drive as long as they don't decompensate? So I promised Dave and I didn't really practice this, but he just set it up. So the Florali trial, that's what you're getting at. So different levels of support trying to stave off intubation, and this is before COVID. What this showed is that patients with non-invasive support had a higher level of intubation than high flow nasal cannula. Now, the classic argument to this trial was, well, that was just selection bias. The people that the docs put on non-invasive looked worse and they needed more support. However, I think it's more complex than that. I think if you put someone on CPAP versus BiPAP, two very different modes of uh, support. CPAP, like Dave said, if they have recruitable lung, helps. If you oxygenate better on that, good. If I put someone who's working like a young 35-year-old football player on BiPAP and they start taking tidal volumes of 900 cc's to two liters, that is someone who's going to cause self-induced lung injury and it's worsened by the, the mode of support I've put. You're giving them extra pressure when they don't need it. It's exactly. causing worse distension. And I think what we saw in Florali was part of that. Possibly, that yeah. those patients had self-induced lung injury. I can't prove it because that's not with the trial, but I think that's what we're seeing more and more in COVID and that's the anecdotes coming out. Be very careful with anecdotes, but you just need to know that both ventilator-induced lung injury and self-induced is possible. So just because the SATs look better, in the long run, playing the long game, you could actually be setting your patient up for a worse outcome. True. So what, what does that look like in Italy? And now we're getting some um, CPAP helmets. What that looks like is the CPAP non-invasive helmet uh, and ongoing support. They don't necessarily in intubation. I'm not going to cover what proning looks like in intubated ventilated patients. What I'll remind you is the goals low tidal volume if you had to intubate them. If they're intubated, put them on a control mode because we know that in eMERGE. Make sure you aim four to eight cc's per kilogram. How you pick that number is start with four to six. If their CO2 and pH is relatively okay and their plateau pressures are under 30, go higher. 
Where we get a plateau of 30 for is if I take medical students and ventilate them at total lung capacity, their plateau pressure is 30. So no matter how much lung is left, if your plats are above 30, you're ventilating them at above TLC. Driving pressure, as Dave got into, less than 16, that's pretty cutting edge stuff. The evidence doesn't support this, but what Dave alluded to is that's the amount of force I have to aerate the lung with. Remember, SpO2, we don't have a number, do we, Dave? No. Just right. Cytokine storm, one slide on this. And basically, Dave has been uh, telling the province about HLH and macrophage activation syndrome for a decade now, that this is a subset of sepsis patients that probably do worse. Is this macrophage activation syndrome? To be honest, I don't know if we know. I don't know if we can tell if this truly is. There definitely seems to be a trend of hyperinflammation. When looking at various interleukins, it does seem that they're higher than we'd expect on some studies and some studies not. Um, there is without question this theory that there is a cytokine storm going on, that maybe COVID is infecting uh, innate immune cells and causing them to release uh, cytokines, interleukins, that they wouldn't usually in other uh, disease processes. So there is this theory for sure that there is a cytokine storm. I wouldn't say it's confirmed. Again, is this pathological activation or physiologic activation? But there's definitely a trend to people think more and more it's pathologic. And why that's important is Dave's going to talk to you about immune therapy, immune modulatory therapy, and whether that's important or not, we don't know yet. Organ dysfunction, we're going to fly through Yeah, this. I just skipped it. Yeah. We'll say that, okay, the one slide, we can put it back. So there's evidence that maybe every organ could be affected by COVID. There's thoughts from the neurological system and affect the olfactory nerves. There's some uh, hemorrhagic encephalopathies that have been reported, GBS. We know about 15% of people or so get kidney injury. Is this more than the usual sepsis or is it sepsis? Is it microvascular? We're unsure. Liver. We know that people get transaminase elevation, as most viral infections do. Does this translate into clinical outcomes that are worse? Not necessarily. What do you want to say about skin? Ah, COVID toes. Everyone's talking about it. No one fr freaked out about hand, foot, and mouth before, but there seems to be both embolic and uh, vasculitic phenomena associated with COVID that you've seen in other viral infections. Dave, you're Great. Right. Okay, thank you. We're running a little bit behind time, so I'm going to go a little bit quicker. Um, but there's some key things I really do want to cover. So first off, COVID-associated coagulo uh, coagulopathy. From the very beginning of this disease, we started hearing through reports in China and Italy that people seem to be having more blood clots. We heard that, and we heard that they had elevated D-dimers that were inappropriate. Now, for decades, we know there's this tight interlocking inter um, between the inflammatory system and the coagulation of cascade. Why does this exist? From an evolutionary standpoint, it's thought that um, the inflammatory cascade activating the coagulation cascade will create fibrin barriers and prevent the disease from spreading, primarily bacteria. Now, is there something different with COVID? Potentially. Uh, COVID likely infects some of the innate immune cells, macrophages, T cells, and maybe causes them to release more cytokines as we talk about that then will activate the coagulation cascade more. We know that COVID, which attacks the ACE2 receptor, will attack endothelial cells, damage them, and cause leaking of von Willebaum's factor, which has been seen higher in samples taken from COVID patients. Next, the ACE2 receptor that COVID attacks, it converts angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1.7. Angiotensin 2, we know, is a potent vasoconstrictor and activator of the inflammatory cascade. Oh, sorry. Next, uh, we know that high CRPs, high interleukin-6, will actually increase the amount of PA1. This, is one, this will then limit the amount of fibrinolysis, therefore tipping even further toward the coagulation cascade. It's been shown that patients with high PA1s, greater than 660, have 100% mortality. So this is the diffuse thought um, with COVID, but if there's something locally going on at the lung level, again, SARS-2 infects type 2 pneumocytes. Those type 2 pneumocytes and macrophages within the alveoli increase the inflammation, pull more cells in, then along with the endovascular attack of COVID-2, does it create a local phenomenon of microvascular thrombosis? It certainly seems to. And compared to DIC and sepsis, where it's going on everywhere, DIC, you see your platelets drop, they're consumed. The INR and PT go up from consumption of coagulation uh, uh, factors. We just don't see that in COVID. It seems to see normal platelets, normal PT, INR. So is this a local thrombotic effect or pulmonary, what do they call it, pulmonary intravascular coagulopathy? It seems to be real. We see it on pathology and autopsy compared to DI, um, diffuse alveolar damage that we see with ARDS, there seem to be these microvascular thrombosis throughout the lung, again, creating this dead space phenomenon or this BQ mismatch potentially. 
So, as I said pretty early on out of China, the reports around clots, as I said, and uh, D-dimer elevations started to come out and now we're seeing them published. This is just showing a group of patients, 200, that this, um, the people that did not survive had persistently elevated D-dimers over time compared to the patients that survived. Okay, also out of China. Now, Asian people don't have as much risk for uh, DVT and VTE compared to Caucasians, so there's not as much DVT chemoprophylaxis used in China. But then they started to report, they saw a difference between patients that got heparin and didn't get heparin. And what you're seeing here is on the x-axis, the higher the D-dimer, the difference in mortality between patients that got heparin and didn't get heparin gets wider and wider. So the higher D-dimer, if you got heparin, it seemed to be more protective than if you didn't. And also if you had a positive sepsis intravascular coagulopathy score. So is this because they're not getting as many clots in their lungs or throughout their body? Yes, possibly, but it may also be this. Heparin, low molecular heparin and unfractionated, will prevent the binding of SARS to the ACE2 receptor potentially, decrease N of kappa B uh, uh, production of IL-6, and potentially even bind IL-6, this whole cytokine storm concept, and reduce the inflammatory cascade. So that's another concept that heparin may be antiviral and immunoprotective in some form. So as the disease progressed, it came over to North America, we started seeing it in the US. More and more, we started to see, oh, let me make the video go, uh, more and more reports like this. That's terrifying. Yeah. This is, so this is a person that was fully anticoagulated in New York, and despite full anticoagulation, developed what you just saw there. So a large thrombus sitting in the right atrium. Again, multiple times we started to see this. So what should we do about it? First off, talk a little bit about DVT prophylaxis. So what should we do for prophylaxis? Before we do that, we should know what the usual breakthrough is when we discuss about people seeing clots. For critical care, probably the best done study is the PROTEC study. Almost 4,000 patients that got randomized either to uh, noxaparin or, sorry, daltaparin or unfractionated heparin. And you can see here that when you look at proximal DDT, the breakthrough rate of both is around 5 to 6 percent. So on chemoprophylaxis, breakthrough rates around 5 to 6 percent for proximal DDT. And for VTE altogether, breakthrough is around 8 to 9 percent. Outside the ICU, three different studies looking at ward patients. You can see the ones that are on anoxaparin, daltaparin, and fondu. Breakthrough rates between 2.5 and 5%. So keep those in your, in your mind. So these are the publications, most of them preprint that we've seen. So Italy, 388 patients, chemoprophylaxis in 100% ICU, 75% of the ward. VTE in 27% of the ICU patients, 6.6% of the general ward. France, 150 ICU patients all got prophylaxis, VTE in 43%. The Netherlands, 198 patients, 37% of them ICU, all got chemoprophylaxis. In the ICU, 43% have VTE by 14 days, 10% on the ward. An updated study just last week, 184 ICU patients, VTE in 50% by 14 days. And Dave, can I ask, is this just like a catheter-associated clot? Is this like CRT clotting? What kind of clots are these? So this would have to be documented thromboelosin, so PE, proximal distal DTT. Then finally against these, though, we got a, a letter to the editor in New England Journal April 17th, where they took a, looked at 130 mechanically ventilated patients, and they only had a VT rate of 7.7%. Now, only one-third of those had been extubated and two-thirds were still intubated, so they're still at risk. In addition to that, we've seen over and over again in the news, this New England Journal publication, young people are having arterial thrombosis, strokes in young people with COVID that you would not expect to see. So what can we do about it? Well, could we use higher DVT prophylaxis doses? Um, the patients we do that currently in are patients with pelvic fractures, long bone fractures, and spinal cord injuries. We use the higher dose of anox 30 BID. So the reason we do that is this study um, done by Greets, which 344 patients were randomized to get either heparin 5,000 BID or anox 30 sub Q BID, and you can see they reduced their DVT rate by 25%. Now these were trauma patients. They got run over by trucks, hit by trains, they have big pelvic fractures, spinal cord injuries. Their breeding rate was only 1.7% trauma patients, no difference between the groups. So therefore, our um, uh, therapeutics committee has made a recommendation that to suggest for ICU patients to have a higher DVT prophylaxis dose and consider for all admitted patients to get that in 30 BID. 
So what about full anticoagulation? This may be the, the real important question that's highly debatable. Should we be anticoagulating these people? Not a lot of good evidence. This one's interesting. Just came out recently, on May 7th, I believe, 6th, uh, looking at 2,700 patients from New York, and they looked to see if they got full anticoagulation or not. And in the patients that got fully anticoagulated, although they were sicker, biochemically and more likely to get mechanically ventilated, they had a chance of living longer and surviving potentially than patients that didn't. Patients that were mechanically ventilated, even a bigger signal, more likely to live longer and potentially have a higher rate of survivability. Now, immortal time bias plays a big factor here. If you know what that is, if you live longer, you're more likely to get an EVT and you're more likely to get anticoagulated, uh, but at least there's a signal. Now, probably the most important thing from this study, um, that bleeding rates were really low. So you can see in the patients that either got fully anticoagulated or did not, uh, bleeding rates were around uh, 2%, so 2 to 3%, so not hugely difference between the groups. So what should we do? There's different algorithms being published all over the world from different areas. Um, I'm just going to show you a couple of them. This one suggests that anyone who's at risk of high risk, which you can see is even having a SAT less than 90, going to the ICU, fully anticoagulated. Even if you're low risk, you have a D-dimer greater than 500, high dose DVT prophylaxis. You have a D-dimer greater than 3,000, fully anticoagulation. Pretty aggressive. What do you I, think? I think um, there's two caveats to that. One is a systems approach. So uh, normally we would just light that person up with a, like Doppler ultrasounds of the arms and legs looking for a clot and send them to the CT scanner. But uh, given resource limitations with a dirty and a clean zone, you don't want to chew up your CT scan in a busy eMERGE department. So CTing every COVID patient like other centers do is difficult. Mm -hmm. So if your team dimer is 3,000, go looking for the clot. But I would anticoagulate them just based on my personal experience in the COVID unit. But yeah, but what other experience did you have? Tell us a bit. Well, um, I, so... Uh, Dave's been up in there too. Despite full anticoagulation and anti 10 a levels that were therapeutic, patients on CRT clotting off their CRT, patients on ECMO getting full phlegmasia, big DVTs, despite anticoagulation, requiring fasciotomies. Like these are clinically relevant clots. And I believe we've heard that we've never seen that before, fully anticoagulated happening with uh, patients on ECMO like that. Just a couple other ones, same thing. Another one out of the U.S. from the palm crit site saying you have a D-dimer of greater than 1 to 2,000. Don't look like you're bleeding. Fully anticoagulate them. Texas, something similar to their group. If your D-dimer is greater than 1 to 2,000, you get higher dose DVT prophylaxis. Your D-dimer is greater than 3,000, full anticoagulation. So, Dave, I can see the audience asking you, so they're admitting a patient that D-dimer is 7,000 before the admitting service sees them, should they start them on heparin versus low molecular weight? So this is the question we just do not have an answer to, and it's going to have to come down to clinical decision making. Would I fully anticoagulate someone outside the ICU for a D-dimer? I don't think I would right now. I don't think I would. If you're in the ICU and you're now very high risk, in a bed, not moving for sure, um, multiple different lines in place for a high D-dimer, would I fully anticoagulate? I'd consider it. I can say I certainly do look for evidence of clot if I hear that their CRT machine's clotting. Even the nurses like pull their blood at clot or right at chest tube clotting. I look for an indication to start full anticoagulation. But you just had a case. Well, this is, just, this is just sort of interesting. I just put this in here that this is not what we normally do. We don't fully anticoagulate people with just a D-dimer and nothing else. We won't even send the D-dimer and emerge as a swear word. Right? So we just don't even know what these people usually do. So this is a case I admitted this week, someone with a potential vasculitis and urosepsis, and their D-dimer on one day went to 30,000. So what do I do with that? We wouldn't usually anticoagulate that person. So is COVID something different or is it not? So I just think it's food for thought. In the last five to ten minutes here, I'm going to talk about pharmacological therapy. Wow. Never obviously in our careers have we seen anything like this. A new disease, treatments being given, what works, what doesn't work, any various combination, all of them mismatched together from different countries. It's an emotional roller coaster. It's an emotional roller coaster. We have the President of the United States taking, saying take hydroxychloroquine, what do you got to lose, and then publications now showing that um, QT prolongation and arrhythmia are a real thing. So to help combat this, uh, March 13th, we formed the BC um, COVID Therapeutics Committee, and I can't say enough about these individuals, 40 physicians from around the province that have come together, including Adam, uh, that we meet weekly. We discuss all the various therapeutics and come up with recommendations for the province. Um, these are some true champions. 
So we have identified drugs that are relevant to follow in the literature. You can see here the 11 uh, generally that we do talk about every week. We review the literature. In addition to these drugs, we do come up with recommendations around other therapies such as ACE inhibitors, NSAIDs, and as you saw, DVT prophylaxis. You can find our recommendations on the CDC website. Uh, there's a one-pager that quickly summarizes our recommendations and then a 40-page document that has all the, available, all the relevant literature and summaries about why our recommendations are what they are. To quickly go through the antivirals, the ones of relevance, um, this diagram shows you where each of the drugs uh, potentially act from insertion uh, of the virus all the way to the replication process, and I'll show you in detail where they are thought to work. So, convalescent plasma. This one actually gets a lot of press with not a lot of evidence, to be honest. The idea being that people that have had infections, you then take their plasma and you isolate the antibodies and give them to people that are not sick or early sick. Um, the reason why, uh, you can see here, this is where it would act up in the, oh, you can't see that, can you? No, oh, sorry guys. Um, at the area where the spike protein binds the ACE2 receptor. Now, some meta-analysis show that with an influenza and SARS that maybe convalescent plasma was beneficial, and I think that's why there's a lot of work going towards it. At this moment, all we have though really are case series. This is one showing five patients. They got convalescent plasma. What did they see? Oh, if you look at all of these uh, markers of sort of physiologic outcomes, yeah, they seem to get better, but it's not compared to any groups. We don't know if this is what normally would have happened or if the convalescent plasma is actually doing anything. Hydroxychloroquine, probably the most talked about drug in the planet in the last uh, two months. Of course, we've heard Dr. Trump. Dr. Trump, God, never say that. He thinks he's a doctor. Uh, <laughs> he thinks he is. Ultra genius. Anyway, so this is an anti-malarial, been used for decades, thought to be safe. It's used within rheumatology for rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and I put it in here that the rheumatologists actually call it vitamin P because they use it so frequently and they think it has such a low side effect profile. Dave, it, can I just add, like Derek Ingus had a great quote in JAMA that in 1920, JAMA released a paper saying, we don't know whether chloroquine is good for viral pneumonias and we still haven't answered that question. Wow, 19 what? 1920. Oh, timely time. That's fine. <laughs> So uh, you can see on the left-hand side of your screen, sorry, right-hand side of your screen, what hydroxychloroquine is thought to do is these endosomes, the viruses, when they get inside the cell, it raises the pH of the endosome and then won't let the proteins on the virus interact with the endosome wall to get its contents into the cell. Key studies you need to know, uh, about two weeks ago, the chlorocovid study out of Brazil uh, was stopped. It was a randomized controlled trial that looked at either high dose or low dose chloroquine for patients with COVID. As you can see here, there was a trend to higher death with the higher chloroquine dose, and therefore the study was stopped. In the last two weeks, we've seen, or last week, sorry, last week, two large publications from New York uh, looking exposure to this one to New England Journal of hydroxychloroquine. 1,300 patients, 60% uh, got hydroxychloroquine, and they found that the ones that got hydroxychloroquine actually had a higher chance of death, but when you controlled through multivariable analysis and propensity score, it actually showed it didn't do any benefit, but didn't cause any harm. And then just yesterday, I put this slide in here, because Adam and I started making slides about two weeks ago, and we've had to change our slide deck continuously because new publications come out every day. This one was the same uh, similar group from New York, 1,400 patients this time, looking at azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine, and they found that the patients that got those two had a higher chance of death than alone when controlled for model-adjusted estimation of death. Uh, you can see that azithromycin looks like maybe it did better alone. Is this anti-inflammatory? Is this that it's uh, treating bacterial pneumonias? It's unsure. And they also found that those patients that got those two drugs together had a higher chance of cardiac arrest and a higher chance of arrhythmia overall. So just like that, I think hydroxychloroquine is gone. What about Kalitra? Well, we did say that about Kalitra. We said that two we weeks ago, It's right? true, it's true. So Kalitra, anti-HIV medication, uh, it's been used for decades, mostly outside of North America. The idea here, if you look about uh, three quarters of the way down the page, you see the lopinavir, ritinovir. So what it does is it attacks the original proteins that are, pr are transcribed from the RNA. They need to be modified to become the machinery for viral replication. So it impedes that ability to break those proteins down or modify them so they can be used to make new virus. Trial of 199 patients, uh, laboratory confirmed CARS-OV they looked at, randomized to either the uh, Kalitra or standard care alone. 
They found their mean, uh, sorry, their primary outcome was an improvement of two in this scale. It's pretty commonly used now between high score for death, zero, they're out of the hospital and fine. They want to see a difference of two. Uh, no difference in time to clinical improvement. 28 day mortality, uh, statistically not significant, maybe a trend, maybe. And no difference in viral replication over time. And then uh, just on Friday, we got maybe, this might, what do you think, Adam? Is this the first actual positive trial we've seen? It's like a weird time in this COVID land where everything's been negative. Uh, this might be positive. And so this is a study done in Hong Kong, um, 127 patients, so not massive. They got randomized because culturally they don't have placebo groups, so randomized to Calitra or Calitra with ribavirin and interferon, the three. So that's what they got randomized to one of those two groups. And Dave, that's a, that was the big, um, so the preprint that Dave just showed, the first New England trial, even though it was published on the 7th, everyone had access to that data back yes. in March. Yep. Uh, and the, the counter to that argument is the experience in SARS and MERS uh, was that ribavirin with addition to Calitra was probably where the benefit was. So that's why they did this trial. And what they found is that improvement in clinical scores and viral clearance, um, statistically significant. But Adam, is this people are actually maybe doing worse with Calitra and the ribavirin interference protecting them? No placebo group, so we really don't know. More work needs to be done. I think this is where you bring this concept in. Um, if you're using an antiviral and you're using a primary outcome to look for reduced viral titers, um, you should see that before you see any sort of clinical outcomes or mortality benefit. And you see this sometimes where you have negative primary outcome of viral clearance, but then they have positive outcomes being uh, time to recovery. Doesn't really make a lot of sense, unless it's an immunosuppressant. And that trend is with all these studies Dave's talking about, is that patients are given these drugs day five, day eight, day 13, post-symptom onset. So they've already progressed in their illness, right? I think maybe that's one comment to say about this study we just spoke about. Um, oh, sorry. That uh, the difference in the group in this ribavirin uh, study with um, Calitra, they got the drug within two days. And the mortality, all these benefits were seen if they got it within seven days of clinical onset of symptoms, where the previous trial was 13 days. And these ribavirin trials we're going to talk about around 13, 14 days after onset of clinical symptoms. Do you think would we practically be able to do that, Dave, in BC? Uh, two, two days of onset, to get them on an antiviral? It depends. That's public health, right? That's outside of the hospital questions. Um, so ribavirin, sorry, uh, remdesivir, what it does is it acts like a adenosine nucleotide analog, and so it inserts itself into the replication machine and prevents it from making new viruses. We saw three publications around two weeks ago. Um, one that was a drug-sponsored one that isn't super relevant. This one out of China, um, which was actually stopped early because they couldn't enroll patients anymore. Um, but what they found is no difference in any of their outcomes, primarily being viral clearance, which is the primary, but one of 20 secondary outcomes, they found an improvement in clinical, sorry, uh, change in clinical improvement from 21 to 23 days. What do you make of that? I don't know. It's a, 20, a one of 20 different secondary outcomes. Then we have this one, the NIH ACT trial. Um, that they've reported after a thousand patients in term analysis that they found a statistically significant improvement in mortality, sorry, in a clinical outcome of 11 versus 15 days, and then maybe a survival benefit of 8 versus 11 days p value 0.59. But because of this, this trial is no longer randomizing people to the placebo. So all patients are now getting remdesivir, and then in the other adaptive trial design, we'll get other drugs. So I don't know if this is the right move personally. So I don't know if we're going to get a true answer because they've stopped randomizing to placebo. In two minutes, I'm going to talk about immune modulators. So you've probably heard of tocilizumab and serolizumab. This is IL-6 blocker. So what it will do is if there is a cytokine storm, there's excessive amounts of IL-6, it will bind to the receptor, so prevent the activity of that interleukin, causing its effects within the body. That's the concept. So there's multiple case reports showing that maybe it blunts this response, but beneficial. Mitt Secon out of our unit at BGH has done some incredible work looking at people that got toxiluzumab as well as steroids and compared to none, and showed some really interesting potential benefits, at least biochemically. And that's just getting that's submitted for publication. We have this one Twitter report from a France trial. So this is, the, this is what science is right now. And you can see that they say on Twitter that we found clinical benefit. Someone immediately responded with, this isn't helpful, either publish or do not. 
But what they claim is in their study, oh, oh we lost it, uh, of 129 patients, they did find that tocilizumab was superior uh, to the control arm, but not published yet, just on the news. Final topic, steroids. So steroids is probably the most controversial of all of these. Um, steroids are more like a shotgun to the inflammatory uh, system versus like a sniper rifle, which is the IL-6 blockers. You can see here, it uh, affects many different pathways to reduce inflammation and increase anti-inflammatories. I think what I'm going to show you is four slides that show are the forest plots about why some groups have said that we should use steroids in COVID. Um, this is looking at ARDS, all comers of ARDS. And if you look at all the studies together, there is a mortality benefit that favors corticosteroids, any cause of ARDS. If you look for days of mechanical ventilation, same thing, giving steroids, meta-analysis, benefits cortical steroids. If you look at viral ARDS, so just viral ARDS, you can see that it trends towards the control. So maybe cortical steroids doing harm, but overlapping one. Observational studies. If you look at viral pneumonia, you can look at the top or all the influenza trials, pretty clear that steroids cause harm in viral pneumonia. If you look at the coronavirus studies, corona, SARS, MERS, you can see they're all over the place, maybe trending towards benefit with steroids, but greatly overlapping one. You put them all together, sorry, all observational studies again. Then we have evidence coming out of Wuhan when they published their first 201 patients. It seems like the patients that got methylprednisolone did better. No controlling for severity. And then when you look at other studies published from the same area, they show that steroids did more harm, not controlling for severity of illness. So what do we do with this? No one really knows, to be honest. A Canadian group published a guideline in CMHA, and I think this does the most to tell you about how divided the world is. Uh, you can see that the American Infectious Disease Society says don't use steroids. The WHO, the Australian Critical Care Group, and the Brits all say don't use steroids, where the American SCCCM says do in a weak recommendation for ARDS, and then this guideline said yes. And then the Canadian uh, Critical Care Society um, endorsed guideline says no. So what did we do provincially? We said uh, we're a fence sitter, to be honest. Uh, we said there isn't insufficient evidence to recommend for or against steroids. I don't think you were sitting on the fence, though. You said look for other indications, right? That's what the community said. Yeah, so if there's another indication, asthma, COPD, septic shock, recommend giving steroids. Do you give it just for um, the treatment of COVID? Uh, the jury is still out. And I just want to summarize what D Dave just said, because I think this is cru cr crucial for uh, the eMERGE audience, is that what you're trying to say is, is this pathologic response or just a normal physiologic response? If it's normal physiologic response to viremia and steroids, we do know can prolong viremia, you can make the sequelae worse with steroids. Definitely. Versus if this is pathologic, then steroids or the sniper rifle of our guided immune modula their modulation might be effective. We don't know yet. Still has to be worked out in the literature. This is just one slide, just to know there are four different randomized controlled trials that are close to or enrolling within BC. Um, the first three are going to be hospital-based, and then the cold corona study is an outpatient uh, uh, study looking at giving cold chicken. So I think that's what we're going to just skip right to our summary there. Adam, do you want to give your summary points and then we'll go to questions? I think the punchline is just like we've seen before is that your patient's physiology is the most important. So treat the patients in front of you and try to get away from cookie cutter medicine. If you have to intubate them or put them on BiPAP, watch the tidal volumes. Uh, if they're on a control mode, make sure you watch the plateau pressure and the driving pressure. Balance always your differential. So if you have a low pre-test probability and a low community prevalence, do not focus on COVID. But if you have a high suspicion, like Dave's case, even with one negative swab and it screams COVID, protect yourselves, protect your nursing and colleagues, and protect the healthcare system. Treat them like a COVID. Finally, then. Patients are truly, probably, they probably, truly, maybe, are hypercoagulable. Uh, we recommend higher DVD prophylaxis, when to fully anticoagulate, as you said, the jury's still out. Uh, currently only use supportive care, no recommended treatments, steroids and ARDS, the discretion of the practitioner. Uh, RCTs are currently underway, so please wait for these results and support those uh, studies. 
And we will take questions from the audience. You guys, yeah. Are you, oh, yeah. Okay. oh, yeah, we can use it. Sure. All right. Gentlemen, thank you very much. That was pretty comprehensive. And there's lots of questions that have been coming through, sort of while you were talking. So um, let's go back up to the, the start. Jason Whale in, in Victoria was asking, right at the top, start, you were talking about where the virus is detected. And if it's in stool, is that thought to be vi viable virus or not? Because from a public health and public washroom perspective, it could be really important. Wow, excellent question. Um, my understanding is yes, it is thought to be bio viable virus. Uh, there are, where they look where there's ACE2 receptors in the body for the virus to infect, they're actually all over the place. Very prevalent in the pharynx, airways, lungs, very prevalent in the intravascular, and prevalent in the GI system. And so, yes, they're infecting, but that's why we see GI symptoms with diarrhea, et cetera, in some people. And even that might pretend a worse prognosis if the guy GI tract's involved. But as far as anyone knows, yes, they're viable. Yeah, good question, Jason. Um, just to add to that, that it's not just viral or PCR, but it's actually viral culture that's positive from those samples. So yes, uh, one could uh, presume that because the virus cultures out that it is a viable virus and can infect you. Okay. Pardon me? There was a question about There was? Oh, that's after, yeah. Okay. We're just working on another question. So another question from um, uh, Luis Philippe Plant. Um, you're asking us not to intubate early, but if we don't have facilities to do uh, safely do aerosol generating procedures, um, then those patients actually are aerosol generating with CPAP with BiPAP, and it means using up any early uh, negative pressure room that we might have, and being more exposed than I suppose is the thought. Than, than an intubated patient where you can sort of protect the circuit? Great question. And I, do, I don't want to um, step out of my role, but what, I, what I'll step back and say is someone who can cough, um, and if they can cough at 400 liters a minute, while they're on six liters of nasal prongs, their aerosolization risk, I think practically, is the exact same as someone who is coughing during a aerosolizing procedure. And that's what we're saying intubate early for, is that uh, the intubate early is not necessarily, um, the punchline is you intubate early because they would tolerate an RSI. So at six liters, what we were saying intubate early is so that you could not beg them and not spread everything to your team. But what we do know now is that effective PPE, healthcare workers aren't getting infected. So I know the whole infrastructure is a problem, but you can cause harm by intubating someone on six liters of nasal prongs that don't, doesn't need it. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I, I think we're beyond that stage of saying intubate people at six liters nasal prongs. Um, I, I do think that we should be using more um, uh, high flow oxygen in the right situation. Consume it as aerosol generating, but using high flow oxygen, letting them go higher, watch them longer, accept lower sats as we sort of discussed. Uh, we're still not using BiPAP or CPAP. Um, as they rec recommend that they do cause aerosolized genetic procedures, so I haven't used that in my practice at all. Oh. Uh, so I have not. I have not only used high flow oxygen um, within negative pressure rooms, but it's reasonable to do. Um, okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, from Lynn Philiatro, and, and you did go over this um, for VTE in, in COVID-19 patients. You sort of, uh, she's asking about um, how we might safely be able to image patients more aggressively to look for the clots that you were talking about before as opposed to just anticoagulating and assuming. Is there, is there a way in sort of isolating, you know, potentially in big hospitals a CT scanner that's just used for COVID patients or what? Well, interesting thought. You got the money. Yeah, <laughs> build a whole COVID radiology department. Um, so, you know, and if you look in a lot of those uh, algorithms that I presented, um, they say aggressively look for clot. Because again, you're looking for any reason to fully anticoagulate them. So you need to look for those clots. Now, how do you go about doing that? Does that mean that it's people like us going in with our ultrasound, trying to determine if you can see a thrombosis in one of the deep veins? Is it having the text come in? I'd be nervous about relying on uh, people's skills that usually would not be doing that. Um, so I think it does have to people that are regularly skilled. Same thing with doing CTP scans. So you have to yourself sort of determine the balance of sending into the scanner the potential risk of transport contamination uh, versus just anticoagulating them. 
to be honest. And as we see here again and again, if you have a high risk, it doesn't seem like they're bleeding. I looked up the risk of pulmonary hemorrhage. It's less than a percent that's reported in the literature right now. And so I think this is an individual clinician's um, question they have to answer for themselves. And I think, Lynn, uh, your questions are always uh, profound. I think that this comes back to something above all of us is that we have to change the way we do medicine. We have to go back to excluding differentials like we did before COVID because we're going to see those patients like we did before. So we have to have a systems level approach where we can handle clean and dirty patients. And whether that's cohorting hospitals or, or cohorting within hospitals, very different models. We don't know what the right answer and uh, it's variable around the whole world. So as a provincial institution, we're going to have to figure that out. Okay, thank you. Um, Frank Schurmeyer asks, um, there are no studies so far on patients with HIV, as far as, as, far as we know. So, so like there's maybe an answer, but, but wondering if heart is, is protective, and, uh, and, and, and there's a corollary to this question, and that is, is would that potentially be sometime, some, some reason why we're not seeing the expected number of serious cases from the downtown east side and the addicted population? It's a great question, uh, Frank. And so cohort, not an RCT, but uh, now published by WHO through a resource that we'll send around that basically has compiled all resources for COVID, all papers based on themes. And out of yesterday, a moderate, like I think 100 patients before used to be interesting, and now it's a small uh, cohort when it comes to COVID level, but no change in mortality versus the general population. So even one side says maybe those drug regimes like Kaletra uh, for post-exposure prophylaxis, if they're on those, uh, do they have a decreased risk? That number isn't panning out, but we see that at least their mortality for what it looks like right now in early studies is not increased. So it's a very quite interesting question and not protective per se, um, but we'll have to see. I think what Dave brought up, is, is this physiologic or pathophysiologic response in the 20% of patients that get hospitalized, we still don't know. And just to follow up on that, they, the, there's been studies from the rheumatologist trying to follow their patients in databases as well with Plaquenil, and it does not seem to be protective. And the conclusion has been that people that are on long-term Plaquenil for lupus or rheumatoid arthritis seem to have the same outcomes and the same rate of uh, illness that other patients would have. Yeah, is that, but potentially it could be protective because those patients may be higher risk for serious disease with the comorbidities that they have as well. So if they're the same as a placebo group. We're making big leaps there. Yeah. Big, <laughs> very, very possible, very possible. Yep. They can't, they can't hear you. Oh, oh, yeah. That rationale makes sense, Jim, totally. Um, and and uh, very attractive to all clinicians, I think. But the, the thing is that with the rapidly developing landscape right now that, that we think the answer is right, just like Kalitra, and then it comes back, it's totally wrong. So I, it's all hypothesis generating for now, unfortunately. Okay. Um, well, there was one question up here. So we'll be posting this on the on the EMN website, right? And so people will be able to see it. Some people were wondering if they could have your slides. I mean, your slides, you spent a lot of time with them. Yeah? Yeah, sure. Be, yeah, we actually be... included a bunch of slides at the end of like management yeah. and CPR management. We were hoping to certain questions that we got those, yeah. Yes, yeah. so, yes. the answer is we will be happy to share our slides. I'm happy to share okay. our slides. So anybody can contact you two guys. Probably the best way is to direct it to you guys. Yeah, what, $2 a slide? slide, is that about right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'd be happy to share. I'm an R7, I need some bills to pay. But what I'll say is uh, it's on Google Drive, and we'll send out the link. Uh, it'll be posted, so anybody with the link can download it. Oh, no that, problem. It is a big file. We're sorry, there's a lot of photos. 180 megabytes, so uh, make sure your internet connection's good. And Daniel Ting is a shout out to uh, everybody that's uh, helping with and, and to keep on going with um, with COVID RC RCTs. If you're involved with that, the National COVID ER Registry study um, is now underway at many sites across the province. And it's going to be across the country as well. And so that's an, an effort to try to learn more about patients that are in the early days, seen and emerged, some sent home, et cetera. <clears throat> so I don't think that's a real question for you. You know, it's interesting too, and this is just a, I think for the future, this is a theoretical idea, I guess, that um, this shows our inability to respond quickly when it comes to therapeutics in the form of research and our want as clinicians and humans to act to do something. Because if you look at all the reports, even the studies coming out of 
uh, China and Italy, it'll be looking at one drug, but it's like patients were on steroids, Kaletra, hydroxychloroquine, and they don't necessarily report the ratios between the different groups. And so I just wonder um, if our infrastructure for research and, and pandemics in the future, if we can really prepare to act quickly have trials done so that by the time we get to the stage now, three, four months in, we actually know which drugs to use and what combination. I think that's a huge point in general, that redundancy has been huge, um, not just in research but policies, uh, and it, it's not fast enough. So people from a research perspective have really shit on the preprint, uh, and that's published by Yale and, and uh, um, very good institutions. So, a lot of smart people are creating these preprints, and the reason is, is because look at JAMA. Just in the last two months, they've their yearly uh, editorial papers, just a one pager, usually about a thousand a year. They've already had three thousand submissions, uh, and they can't keep up to that data. So um, yes, it is not peer reviewed. It can be post reviewed by peers, and just watch Twitter when a preprint comes out. It's the best journal club you've ever been a part of. Um, but that mechanism is able to get information out there. But what Dave just said, I think, is nails it right on the head, is that we are not ready for rapidly changing environments, both from research or policy. The British had a bunch of trials that were dormant, that were already approved by IRBs, and they, bam, are going to publish in the next couple of weeks really good RCTs that were set up and good to go. And the North America, we are years behind that, and we're going to learn from that, hopefully, and coordinate. The other thing is policies. I just, we're not a part of policies, but I think we all saw how many provincial CPR intubation PPE guidelines were developed locally, and that's a waste of time. Um, having that redundant process with every group doing their own thing instead of at a provincial and national level, which was eventually done, but I think a lot of manpower hours were wasted in the early weeks trying to do that work that everybody was doing the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, question here about um, the, the cases, I guess, that have PCR positive tests after a long period, after patients have got well, potentially, so 45 days later, is there evidence that that's still live virus or is that just viral particles? Oh, no. I, okay. I've laid up the, the most interesting one I was from our Wuhan call. So we had a call with some physicians from Wuhan maybe about a month and a half ago, month ago, um, and they described one of their surgeons who has been positive, negative, positive, negative, positive over a three-month period. And there is no way you're going to have dead virus RNA kicking around from multiple months before. So the assumption and is that, yes, he recurrently became positive. His serology never became positive either, I believe they said. Again, this is just secondhand through some physicians we were speaking with. Uh, but it certainly seems like there are groups or individuals uh, that don't amount to immune response and continue to have positive virus or the super spreaders. And we're starting to see that with serologic studies coming out now, uh, where 15 to 30 percent are non-responders and up to 60 percent are low responders. Now, we don't know what a specific titer level for IgG means. We have no idea. Is it like measles, that the absolute number means nothing, whether it's present or not, affords some neutralizing antibody and protection? We don't know yet. But that has big implications for public health, vaccinations, return to work, our own healthcare force, and we don't know. Okay. Yeah, and the specific idea that that's people that have some infections that have those low rates. Is a vaccine going to be possible? And we all know there's never been a vaccine for a coronavirus before, so... There's a question here, and it refers to a critical care study in 2013. Um, and the question is, are opioids protective? It's from Andy. I'm not sure which Andy. Ooh, opioids if opioids protective. themselves are protective. Um, I can tell you, every drug under the sun has somehow been related to being yeah. detrimental or protective. Yeah. It, 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 everything. Yeah. You know, you do wonder a little bit, like, me, I don't know if it's talking about the idea maybe of um, suppressing your own, your own innate uh, respiratory drive, which, you know, opiates do no, that well. Just, I think he's, there's another little comment about it. It said, opioid receptors control viral replication in the airways. Is there any evidence that those are linked? Um, I, I don't know the trial, Andy, but what I would say is just like Dave's point, there's a lot of um, up-and-comers and looking for a silver bullet. Uh, if you look on the counter in that same population, active smoking decreases your risk. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, like, like it's a roller coaster, and I think it's 
that there's a lot of uh, sample bias going on a lot of the time. So I don't know that paper. This wasn't related to COVID, and it just, clar just clarified that it was an RSV study, just oh, okay. sort of from the you know from the viral concept. Yeah, hard to come. Yeah, don't know. Okay. So um, we've, I think we've come to the end of the main questions. Uh, fantastic job, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you. Wonderful rounds. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, All sorts yeah. of uh, accolades. And I would like to add to that and say, guys, this, is, this has been tremendous. Awesome. Maybe a new way we sort of carry on. You guys have started, not only are we on Zoom, but you guys are doing the back and forth with the mic. It's great, and right? It's been really, really lively and really dynamic. Maybe gets you a little bit over time, but the yeah. discussion's good. Yeah, no. Oh, wow. 155 people joined. Wow. Thank you, everybody in the audience, for came to listen to come, to come to listen to this. And, uh, and, and you guys, again, thank you so, so much. And Pleasure. We'll close it down. All right. Take care, everybody. Be safe out there.